Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jonathan Briggs. I'm the uh, assistant law librarian here and uh, at the Fort Bend County Law Library. And this is our express class on Word. And it's going to be a relatively short class. Uh, and I'll get started here in just a second. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so let me do that real quick and I'll get you kind of onto a Word document. We're going to talk about the utilization of Word uh, in the context of legal pleadings. So let me share my screen to get into Word and we'll get going. Okay, so here we are, our express class. These are classes we hold usually every Thursday uh, at this time at 10 a.m. and they're about 15 to 30 minutes long, depending uh, on the topic. And uh, we look at a very variety of subjects. Uh, we look at our databases uh, that we have on offer here at the Fort Bend County Law Library, both Westlaw and Lexis and another one called Hine Online. And those are our legal databases. Uh, we also talk about some sort of word processing uh, and other programs that people use, such as Word, uh, Adobe, and PowerPoint. Uh, so we kind of try to talk about those things in the context of a pro se person uh, using these things, and a pro se person being someone who is self-represented. And that's a lot of what we deal with here at the law library. Um, you know, folks coming in, besides from attorneys who represent folks, uh, people come in with various legal matters that they need to attend to. And sometimes that involves filing what are called pleadings. And uh, pleadings are simply things that are filed with the court, uh, things such as a petition to start a lawsuit. Uh, that is an example of a pleading. Uh, so we're gonna talk about those uh, and just some hints on using Word and, and talking about pleadings and legal documents and sort of the general structure. Now, of course, obviously this is not legal advice or anything like that. It's just some of my knowledge that I've learned over the years uh, and might help uh, a person uh, take care of their own legal work. So we'll kind of scroll through here. Um, like I said, we're kind of doing these things via Zoom now. I used to do them uh, or have done them in person for a few years. Uh, now we're uh, having to do them via Zoom, given the current situation. At some point, uh, we'll get back, hopefully, to having them in person. And it's a little easier to teach in person. I'm not sure if we're going to continue to do sort of a combined thing, then do sort of a Zoom, and then also do, uh, do in-person type things. So I hope something, this is the first time I'm teaching this particular class on Zoom, and I hope uh, it, nothing gets lost in the translation, I guess you could say. So I think most people, and, and these are kind of my notes that I use to talk about this class, you know, most people are familiar with uh, Word or Word Perfect, uh, and it's kind of in the context of what's called word processing. And that's a, just a fancy name for typing, you know, putting together uh, paperwork. You know, we used to type letters on typewriters, now we use computers. Obviously, it's a lot easier and more user-friendly. It's easier to edit things, save things, copy things, and use them in various formats. You know, two of the primary formats that folks use are either Word or WordPerfect, and then Adobe uh, in the context of legal pleadings. Um, and taking, a, and so let's talk about what a pleading is. So say if you have, and we'll talk about it in the context of a civil lawsuit, uh, civil lawsuit as opposed to a criminal case. Uh, civil case, those can be things like breach of contract or a personal injury case, such as a car wreck, or, or any number of types of cases. Obviously, a lot of this is, translates similarly to criminal law. Uh, attorneys and folks representing themselves in the criminal law context file documents with the court. You know, their paperwork, their things that they need the court to, to see, things that help them make claims. So a petition is something that starts a civil lawsuit. If you're going to file suit against someone, you file a petition in the appropriate court. You know, there's three levels of trial court here in Texas. Uh, justice courts, the JP courts, uh, county court of law, and district courts. And essentially these will be, these things will be similar across uh, all those types of courts. So a pleading is something you file with the court, uh, a petition, an answer. And then there's another thing called a motion. A motion is something that is used within the context of a lawsuit. So you might uh, be asking uh, the court to do something uh, while the case is pending. And those can be all types of things. And I talk about here, uh, if you scroll down here, looking at the last paragraph, you know, a motion can deal with kind of case management type things. So say a case is coming up 
and it needs to be delayed. A case is set for trial and there's some reason that it needs to be delayed. There has to be a, a legal basis for doing so. Uh, but you know, it's a thing that often occurs. And obviously now during the coronavirus issue, a lot of cases have been continued and reset probably just on the judge's own motion, which will be called sua sponte. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, a person, a litigant, someone who's involved in a case will have to approach the court and ask them uh, to do something. Uh, so say they need a continuance of a trial date. You know, a trial case has been pending for several months, but something has come up that necessitates uh, uh, someone having to delay the case and ask the court to do so. It's generally uh, at the court's discretion to do so, uh, and their a court will be reviewed by an appellate court under a, a standard of abuse of discretion. So it's really, in general, it's up to the trial court uh, you know, and if you give them good cause and it's probably the first time, it might be, you know, in all likelihood, it'd probably be granted. So you're going to come to the court asking for a motion for a continuance. And, or there might be an, uh, something going on in the case where somebody's not doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, as a civil case progresses, uh, there's a period in which people do what's called discovery, where you are trying to gather facts and information from the other side. You know, maybe it's uh, paperwork or medical records of some sort that'll be of assistance to uh, putting the case on in front of a jury. Uh, so you, you have a period of time in which to ask for those documents and ask the other side questions uh, about the facts of the case, about their behavior, things of that nature. Uh, so maybe you've sent the appropriate, what's called discovery to the other side, uh, asking them to produce certain documents or answer certain questions that they're required to do under the rules of civil procedure, but they're being recalcitrant. They're not doing it. They're not responding. Uh, so you might file a motion to compel, go to the court, ask the court to compel them, to force them to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, and so you'd ask the court to do that. What I'm looking at in this one today, what I was going to use as my example, uh, is what's called a motion for summary judgment. And this is what would be called a dispositive motion. So like I said, there's various categories of motions. Uh, a dispositive motion would seek to have a disposition in the case. It's seeking to uh, essentially possibly end the case, uh, to have the case, like I said, have a disposition. So you might bring what's called a motion for summary judgment. Uh, at a certain point in time as the case has progressed, uh, if you have the uh, facts and law on your side, you can ask the court to uh, dismiss the case, say if you're a defendant, to dismiss the case uh, without trial. And that's why it's called summary judgment. It will be a summary disposition. Uh, you might have heard the terminology like a summary execution you see in the movies. You know, maybe somebody's captured on the battlefield and the uh, other side just, you know, shoots them. That's a summary execution. That's a, a disposition without a trial. Those folks didn't have a trial. Obviously, this is, you know, something like that. But under the appropriate circumstances, the court will uh, undercut someone's ability to have a trial if they find that according to the facts in the law, they're not really entitled to uh, a trial. So uh, you would have to show the court that there's no genuine issue of material fact to be decided by the fact finder, meaning there's no facts in dispute that the jury would need to decide, uh, and that you're entitled to judgment as a matter of law, that the other side is not entitled to win under the law. They can't make their case even at a minimal level. Uh, so one classic example of a motion for summary judgment would be a uh, statute of limitations uh, to show that the uh, plaintiff did not bring the suit within the appropriate statute of limitations, be it one year, two years, four years, and you put on you know, your evidence showing that they're not even entitled to judgment as a matter of law because they didn't bring the suit in the appropriate time. So what you're gonna wanna do then is file this motion. Uh, you know, there's rules governing uh, the filing of this particular type of motion, uh, and, and you have to follow those. Uh, oftentimes, and kind of ties in with the uh, other uh, classes we teach about Lexis and Westlaw, you know, we get a lot of these forms that we provide to people when they ask us for certain types of documents. We look in our databases, or they look in the databases themselves, and find these types of forms. So you'll see here, uh, obtaining forms and documents. Uh, those things can come from our databases, such as Westlaw and Lexis. Uh, they have a lot of coverage of not just case law and statutes and uh, secondary materials, such as law review articles, but they have a lot of forms and information about uh, 
pursuing these types of things, say, such as pursuing a motion for summary judgment. Things on Westlaw, such as the O'Connor series of books, talks about the sort of nuts and bolts of doing something like a motion for summary judgment or in our Texas litigation guide, which is on Lexis. And then they'll have the forms in there uh, and you can download those forms in Word format uh, or you can have them emailed to yourself in Word format so that you can work on them. And then it's a case of you taking those template forms and it's gonna take a bit of work, of course, to uh, review them carefully, to edit them, make them specific to your case, both from a factual and legal standpoint. And so this is kind of the part where I usually, if I was having y'all in class and it's somewhat limited on uh, Zoom as to how much sort of jumping around on various uh, documents I can do. So I kind of merge these documents and I, I talk about some of the basics, but I think most people know you know, how to open up a document, uh, you know, to start a new document. You know, you, you might go over here to uh, the file deal and, and say do a new document, something like that. And you choose a new document, you open up a blank document. But I'm gonna kind of skip some of that stuff because I think that's real basic and I'm glad to, to if you, you know, need to shoot me an email or give me a call afterwards for some basic help on this stuff, I can kind of do it. You know, I'm not an expert in Word. I'm just a person who's used it uh, for quite a long time. You know, I started uh, in my career, I used WordPerfect mostly, and then kind of the world sort of seemed to shift mostly to Word, though there are some people that still use and prefer WordPerfect. I think Word probably is 90% of the, the uh, word processing uh, world anymore. And so there's just some, you know, you have the document that you've sent to yourself, say, from Westlaw or Lexis in Word format, and you open it, and you're going to start to change it to make it fit your case. And so, you know, there's just different things you can do. Obviously, you can save the document. You know, you go to, you know, the save function. Uh, you know, you can attach documents to emails and so forth once they're finished. I think a big thing in using Word is converting it into PDF format. And that comes into play not as much for pro se folks who represent themselves because they don't have to e-file. Attorneys do have to e-file stuff, which means they no longer go down to the clerk's office generally and file the paperwork and hand them, you know, uh, you know a pleading such as this. Uh, they don't hand it to them anymore. They do what's called e-filing. So it's obviously over the internet using what's called an e-filing provider. And you file that, end up filing that document with the appropriate clerk and, you know, serving that document and so forth. So say if I was doing a motion for summary judgment, I'm an attorney and I would do the e-filing thing. And I would also use the e-service function on e-filing. Um, so you say you have your Word document and you've got it ready to go. You've finished it. Uh, but you need, if you're going to e-file it, you need to convert it to PDF. And so it's real simple now. It used to be a bit of a, uh, uh, a uh, chore to get it done. It's now real simple. You know, you go to file and you go to over here. If you look on my left-hand side here of the screen, you go to save as. And I can just create, I can, what will happen is it'll maintain that same Word document. Say I've saved it to my desktop or a thumb drive or a file somewhere. And so... I've already got it saved as a uh, Word document, but then I hit the Save As function, uh, and, and it's gonna ask you where you wanna save it and so forth. And it's gonna say save as to, uh, let's see. I'm not fam as familiar with this, uh, with this computer, I'm on my laptop. But you go to the Save As function, and you save it as a PDF. And then you have it saved in either your thumb drive as a PDF or on the desktop. And then when it comes time to e-file, you're going to simply, you know, they'll you'd go through the process and I can't go really what e-filing is right now, but it's a matter of, you know, getting on the e-filing service, uh, getting into your particular case and, uh, and then attaching a document uh, and you, you know, you'll hit, I think it's attach uh, or upload and you'll upload that PDF document because that's what's required for e-filing. And then, then it's, you know, it's filed with the clerk and you use a service function as well. And it's served on the other side. Um, you know, I found just when I'm initially drafting a document, if you look at here at number seven down here, you know, these spacing things up at the top, you got normal and different types of things. And I found that using the no spacing one is easier. It kind of takes out a lot of the, it's, it just makes it, you know, single spacing and then you can kind of go in and clean it up later, you know, make certain things double spacing, certain things single spacing. I found this one uh, to be sort of very user friendly in the initial structure of a document. It doesn't sort of have some of the, uh, you know, built-in stuff that you might not want. And so I always kind of counsel folks on things when, especially pro se folks, because you're coming in and you're, you're 
anxious maybe about your case and you're, you're not confident in, in what you're doing because you're not a lawyer. This is new to you. It's, it's not because you're not smart or something. It's just this is new to people. They're trying to uh, take care of things themselves, their legal affairs. And so they're, they might be a little bit, you know, nervous about how to do things. Um, you know, I, just a sort of a general word of advice is don't overthink something. You know, uh, you have to obviously comply with the rules and so forth of the of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, let's say, and specific rules of the court and how they like things done. But, you know, when you're doing something, just think about it in the context of I'm coming before the court uh, and I want them to do something uh, and I want to convince them that I'm right and that it should you know, that um, what I'm asking for should be granted. So you're telling the court, you know, who you are. I'm the plaintiff in this case. Uh, this is a car wreck case. Uh, you know, a month ago uh, or two months ago, I sent written discovery out and the other side never responded. And so I'm asking the court to uh, uh, make them respond pursuant to the rules. And then you give the court the legal basis that will allow them to find on your behalf. You know, you say rule you know, 196 of the rules of civil procedure, you know, requires them to respond to requests for production of documents uh, unless they assert appropriate objections. And so uh, you tell the court what you want and why, uh, why they should grant that deal, why the other side is wrong, let's say. You know, so you give the court the legal basis upon which they can find for you the rules and maybe a case that supports you. You know, you can say the Supreme Court and the blah blah case from 1999 dealt with this exact same issue where uh, one of the parties was not responding to written discovery and the you know the trial court uh, made them do it and the supreme court agreed with that so you're giving the court the basis upon which they can find in your favor and then what's another portion always of, of a motion is there's components and we're going to look at those components in a minute of a motion of a pleading uh you're going to look at those uh, to let me back up, you're going to have certain components that make up sort of a pleading, a motion. Uh, there's certain parts of it that you need to include. And I'm going to look at those coming up uh, as we scroll further down. But I definitely wanted to mention at this point, a proposed order is crucial because you got to, you got to ask for something in the motion and then you present to the court a proposed order that then if they agree with you, they will, you know, they might edit it or whatever, but you're presenting a proposed order. This sort of takes the, language that you're asking for and turns it into active uh, language where they say, you know, I asked for the court to do this in this motion. And the court then says in the order, on this day came the defendant uh, in this lawsuit and asked the court to uh, grant a motion to compel on the other side for their failure to respond to written discovery. Uh, the court finding that the uh, defendant's motion is, uh, is you know, appropriate, uh, hereby orders that the plaintiff respond to the written discovery completely by this date. And so it puts your uh, motion in action and gets you the result that you need, which is an order from the court that the other side has to comply with. So, um, so without further ado then, here's my contact information. Let me, let me give you that real quick. And you know, if ever I can be of assistance to you, I know we're dealing with stuff remotely now uh, and it makes things a little bit harder on everybody, of course, and, and we're glad to, to help from a, uh, you know, from a distance. Um, uh, my phone number, or the main phone number here at the Law Library, is 281-341-3718. Uh, and then I, my email address is right there. It's Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N dot B-R-I-G-G-S at Fort Bend, spelled out, dot L-I-B dot T-X dot U-S. You know, and I, I'm willing to do as much as I can from here to send things to you, information, forms, and so forth. So let's kind of look at then a template pleading, uh, the things we've been talking about. Uh, this is the motion for summary judgment. And I'm gonna talk about some of the components then of a pleading. So we've got what's called the caption uh, here. The, the caption is simply the case identification materials. You got the cause number, the, the number that was assigned to the case. You got the party identification over here. Uh, you've got the court identification. You know, we're here in district court in Fort Bend, you know, court number one, two, one, two, three. Uh, then you have the title. Simply, what is this? This is defendant's traditional motion for ju summary judgment. And then you get into what, what I would call the body of the pleading. And this is obviously the primary part of it. You know, you might have a little introductory paragraph, you know, kind of a standard. This is very standard for lawyers that will be very familiar with this stuff. Um, it's just a case of saying, you know, 
defendants come comes before the court and uh, pursuant to this, ask the court to do this in support of uh, this motion, defendant uh, will show you as follows. And then, then you might have, and this you know, is fairly commonsensical, I guess, once you look at it, you know, you have an introduction. It's just, it's just like anything else. It's like a letter maybe, or something else used in another context besides the law. You know, you might have an introduction here. And so you might just, you know, give sort of a, some general information about the case. You might do a paragraph like background facts, you know, on this date, this date, this date happened, and so-and-so happened and, and so forth, kind of giving the court the lay of the land uh, of the case so that they can look at this motion and kind of get a good idea of what's going on. Because you got to remember, a judge, you know, has hundreds of cases on their docket and they might, depending on the court, they might have a wide variety of cases. They might have criminal cases, family law cases, civil cases, probate cases, uh, all manner of things. So uh, they've got a lot to deal with. So it's obviously you want to inform the court as much as possible without being overly verbose, give them a concise but complete uh, rundown of things. It will na enable them to kind of look at this document and, and get a real good idea of what's going on in the case. And then in the context of a traditional motion for summary judgment, there's called a standard of review. And I kind of talked about that earlier. Uh, it's the standard that the court is going to have to follow in judging what's called a motion for summary judgment. And then you, if you're, uh, I have a paragraph kind of summarizing what the summary judgment evidence is, the, the facts and stuff that you're going to bring forth that supports it. You might have affidavits supporting it, evidence, documents, uh, something that the court can come before the court and consider uh, in support of your motion. Uh, and then you get to kind of the argument authorities. And this is the, I said, this, it ain't going to be this short. Uh, this is probably the largest single part. This is where you kind of put it all together. You, you apply the facts that you uh, alluded to in the earlier part of the motion. Uh, you bring forward this uh, using the, uh, uh, the evidence uh, that you have uh, in the context then of the standard of review that the court has to do. And you tie it kind of all together uh, in basically stating why your motion should be granted. Uh, so this is the largest single part. And there's just a, you know, you, on some sample forms, you can see it. And it's just a case of putting a structure together, a logical, uh, complete uh, discussion of the facts. And obviously, you know, you say, well, how long is too long? How short is too short? Some things do require very lengthy documents. Obviously, the shorter, the better, because it's more likely the judge will read them. Judges can vary. They, some judges are very complete and very up to speed on things. You, you'll come in and they might know more about your case sometimes than you feel like you do. You know, they're like, I've read your motion. They understand the motion completely and, and they're ready to go. Um, other judges uh, aren't as complete or, you know, maybe don't like reading things that are as long. So you kind of got to tailor it, you know, be as complete as possible, uh, get, but get the most bang for your buck. You know, if you can state what you need to state and you know, five or six pages as opposed to 30, that's probably better. Uh, then you got your conclusion where you wrap it all up. You kind of talk, you know, conclude uh, and give them some kind of a nice summation. And then you have what's called the prayer where you formally ask the court to do something, you know, wherefore premises considered. That just means, you know, based on everything that I've basically stated above, I respectfully ask the court to do this, 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 and this. Uh, and then you have what's your signature block. Obviously you got to identify who you are, uh, you know, who you are, your contact information, who you represent. You might be the pro se defendant. You know, here's your signature line. You got to sign the pleading. Then you have a certificate of service. Uh, this is another component of a document. And you uh, have to serve a copy of things on the other side in accordance with what Rule 21A of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. You know, obviously, in all fairness, you have to send stuff to the other side so they have a chance to respond and so forth. You know, you're not going to get your motion granted unless you've shown at the very least that you've served this on the other side. They got to have a chance to respond. They might respond to your motion. Uh, they'll file a response, uh, maybe, you know, countering what you have to say. And that's how the judge will then have to judge it and do their job. So you have to serve things on the other side. There's various means you can do that. E-filing, of course, if you're doing e-filing, there's e-service. You can send it in the mail, fax it, uh, emailing it, uh, there's various ways you can do it that are appropriate. Depending on the court, uh, you'll probably have to either have an oral hearing on this type of motion or it can be considered under submission and you'll have to arrange for a hearing or you'll have to comply by their submission date. Submission means they're going to consider the motion at a certain time 
uh, just on the paperwork as opposed to there being an oral argument at a hearing. And so courts sometimes want certain types of motions uh, heard by submission where you obviously still got to comply with the appropriate time frames, and each court has sort of a submission date usually each week uh, you know and so you you uh, you would provide a notice of submission and that gives the time frame in which the other person would uh, be able to respond but let's just say you're gonna have an oral hearing on this motion for summary judgment again using the same caption and so forth uh, you uh, provide a notice of oral hearing you'll contact the court obtain a hearing date at the appropriate time uh, and inform the other side on this date uh, at this time in this courtroom at this address uh, this motion will be heard by the court uh, and that's the the notice you give to them the same thing you then you do a signature block uh, you do a certificate of service for this document uh, and you're good to go so then we come to the kind of the, the the last major part of it and kind of where the rubber meets the road we talk about the motion where you're asking for something now here's the order same thing you got a caption that you put on the top that identifies the case and you have the proposed order and you can kind of see the the uh you know kind of how you would generally structure it you know on this day came to be heard the defendant's traditional motion for summary judgment you know the court uh, upon consideration of this is of opinion that the motion should be granted it is therefore ordered that blank 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 you know whatever the court happens to be ordering in this uh, instance it would be that the case is dismissed uh with prejudice meaning uh with prejudice to refiling it meaning the case is over um and so you you want to have a proposed order that grants you the relief the result uh, that you uh, that you're seeking by this motion uh, obviously if you say the motion for summary judgment was granted and it was a, a full final summary judgment the other side might appeal the granting of that summary judgment saying hey they shouldn't have deprived my right to trial uh, they didn't the other side didn't qualify the judge was wrong in how they ruled because of this so anyway that's kind of the basics of a, of a of a pleading i know i've got to cover a lot and i'm trying to cover a lot and i've only probably got a few more minutes uh in the class because uh my uh, our current zoom account only allows us classes to go 40 minutes so we're about at the 30 minute mark and i want to go through a little bit here on the different styles of the case it's just it, this won't be too complicated but you talked about you know at the top of the case there's the they call it the caption also use the style of the case uh is it sort of used interchangeably like i said it's that top part of the case uh, on on the you know on a motion or a pleading and you got that you got that cause number here uh, that you know identifies what cause number it is it's just essentially the file number and then you've got like i said below that you've got the identification of the parties the identification of the court and there's different types ways it's done depending on the nature of the case you know family law and so forth uh see so we have a, a a variety of uh, captions that you can put on there you know that will be appropriate for a, a case so say this is a divorce without children in the matter of the marriage of Jane Doe and John Doe or you might have a, a case just involving maybe custody or something like that or child support doesn't involve a divorce it might just be in the interest of blank a child uh, or you might have a, a divorce with children in the matter of the marriage of Jane Doe and John Doe and in the interest of baby Doe. Uh, so there's just different kinds of things. Then you have, you know, just your typical case, your personal injury or commercial case. You know, this is a, say it's a car wreck case. So we have this one here, you know, uh, John Doe versus Federal Express, or uh, you might have some business dispute, you know, Bank of America versus uh, Wells Fargo, something like that. So, you know, that's your typical, you know, plaintiff defendant thing. Uh, in criminal cases, it's uh, cases always brought in the name of the state of Texas because that's the laws that were allegedly violated. So you have the, the state of Texas uh, versus John Doe, uh, and that's, that's a criminal caption. Uh, so that's kind of my, my general presentation on this deal. Let me unmute you. Uh, if you want to, if you want to ask a question, uh, you're, you're welcome to, uh, otherwise I'll end the course. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you need anything, uh, feel free to, to, uh, email me or call me. I'll be glad to send you this presentation. If you want to, uh, jonathan.briggs at fortben.lib.tx.s.
and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I do have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I would like the presentation. That's the first one. And then the second question, I mean, the first question I have is, um, are these documents um, available as templates somewhere or do we, would we have to like retype this to look like this? A lot of stuff and that's what I was kind of talking about and if I wasn't clear, I apologize. Um, you can, uh, a lot of, we have a lot of template forms for stuff. Uh, so okay. yes, I can send very, you know, I can't say we have everything because sometimes there's, you know, unique motions or something that might be brought, but we do have a lot of different forms and some of them are, you know, that we provide to folks, say from Westlaw or Lexis or some of a couple of our other sources, you know, we can provide those in Word format. Uh, and then it's a case of you, you know, kind of, you know, working on them, making that, you know, editing them carefully and so forth to make them fit your case. So yes, you know, some of the stuff we have, especially in the family law context, we have a lot of the standard forms that are designed for self-represented people and they're fill in the blank type of things. But if you're doing something a little more specific uh, yes, we can send those uh, or provide those to you like in Word format or Word Perfect, where you would then have to edit them. So yes, template exactly is the word I would use. Um, you want to give me your email address? I can actually just go ahead and send it to you if you want to provide me your email, uh, Ms. Foss. Uh, yes, you actually have it. We've been corresponding. Yeah, I recognize, I recognize your name, of course, and I know you've attended a couple of these courses as well. Um, yes. What's, just let me write it down again, just in case. So okay, uh, go ahead, please. It's Ilea, I L E A H. Oh uh, yes, right. Foster F O S T E R. Right. At at yahoo.com. Got you. Ilea Foster at yahoo.com. I'll send you this little thing that I had. You know, it's kind of just my sort of course materials for this. And uh, yeah, and if obviously if I can be of any further assistance, uh, I'll be glad to do it. Perfect. And is the only way to get a template to come through you guys, like we have to request it from you and then you send it to us? Or is there like a, could we go on Westlaw ourselves or could we No, go? that's the, okay. that's the whole thing is, you know, we, we have the subscriptions to Westlaw and that's, you know, out of our budget, okay. uh, you know, it costs it just, yeah, it's, it costs a lot of money. So, my, you know, most forms, I'm not saying there's not, you know, just on the general internet. Yeah. There's stuff out there, but, you know, I think if you want something, um, you know, that's a little more uh, solid from, you know, resources such as Westlaw or Lexis. Yeah, give us, uh, let us know, and we'll, uh, we'll be glad to, you know, find those things for you. Um, you know, that's what we do, especially given the current circumstances. You know, the library is sort of halfway open or halfway closed, however you want to look at it. You know, we're allowed, you know, kind of the compromise that was made is, you know, the, the library branches, and we're part of the Fort Bend Library System, all the branches are physically closed. Um, you know, the, the regular branches are doing stuff like kind of a book uh, thing where you can order books and then, uh, you know, pick them up at the library, kind of a drive through type thing. We're told we can open to lawyers uh, and county staff, but that's the limit. So, you know, everybody, okay. the, the self-represented folks, we're helping at the door. People come to the door and stuff and we get the materials. Or like I said, you contact me uh, via phone or email and I'll be glad to to find, look for, you know, whatever you ask. And if we got results, I'll send them to you. No problem. Perfect. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. No, thank you for attending the course. Hope it was uh, beneficial to you. It was awesome. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Take care.